Bonjour, mes amis. Je ne parle pas en français. If I tried, you would be very unhappy. My lovely daughter says, Mother, never speak in French in France. She is correct. But anyway, it is great to be back to THS. It was fabulous to be last night here. Made it by two hours. But to see my dear friend for many, many years, Chuck O'Brien, receive the Legion of Honor here in France. So very well deserved, so extremely important. Uh, I'll grab it for the Q&A, if there is one. Uh, OK. I began coming to THS in 1993. I have not been at all the meetings. It is wonderful to meet new friends, as well as to see people I have known for many years, even long before the origin of THS. And to welcome, along with my co-chair, Christian Trepeau from Lyon, a dear friend for many, many, many years, New York, then France, and Don Desjardins, part of my laboratory for many, many years. I feel like it's old home week. I'm very pleased to have two other colleagues with me today, or otherwise it would be an all-laboratory event. We are now at the eve of the 50th anniversary of our development of methadone maintenance treatment. The work was conceptualized in late 1963, and in 1964, January, the laboratory of Professor Vincent Dole, who had been an expert in physiology and hypertension, was changed to study potential treatments for opiate addiction. He was joined by two people, a very young resident in internal medicine, the one you see on your far right. That would have been me in 1964. And in the middle, Dr. Marie Neiswander, a psychiatrist who had written a brilliant book that I commend to you, The Addict as a Patient. The three of us got together. We conceptualized the need for pharmacotherapy. We knew it would need to be a long-acting medication that acted at the same mm -hmm. site that heroin, and thus probably morphine, known then to be the metabolite of heroin, would act. We conceptualized also, and I underscore this in 2013, addictions are diseases, diseases of the brain with behavioral manifestations. They are not simply criminal behaviors, nor are they simply weak personalities, but diseases of the brain caused by a variety of factors, including, we now know, multiple variants of multiple genes, in addition, caused by environment, set and setting, cues, and what we now know are epigenetic causes, and also caused by the drug itself, which we predicted by the mid-70s would change the brain's molecular biology and neurochemistry, and we have proven that that is the case. Genetic drugs affect altering the molecular neurobiology of the brain and environment. Everything from your mother and father to your school, epigenetics, cues, set and setting, and especially peer pressure. Our first paper was actually published second, and the reason it was published second was our professor wished to present his exciting data at a major US meeting, what we call the Old Turks, the AAP. So we therefore had to hold that work until June of 1966, when it was presented at the spring meetings of AAP, and then the paper was published. Narcotic Blockade, it is on my website. You can no, find, you can no longer find it in any libraries. But if you go to Creek at Rockefeller.edu, you shall find the entire talk, uh, paper. And then the second paper was published one year later by Dole with his soon-to-be wife, Marie Nicewander, uh, and uh, they published a follow-up study because challengers had said to us, addicts don't ever get well. They always just want drugs. And we said, no, Professor Wickler, a famous man, Professor Wickler, come talk to our patients. And he did. And he said, there's something strange about these people. And we said, the only thing strange, they have survived a mean of 14 years of on-the-street heroin addiction. They've been in and out of prison in and out of detox centers, and they are alive. 
and alive and volunteering for research, and that research paid off. We developed, we chose the only orally effective opiate, that would have been methadone, and we had no analytical tools until 10 years later, developed by my laboratory and also that of Charles and Teresi, to measure anything. So we did something old fashioned, and for those of you that work with patients, I recommend it highly. You look at your patients, you ask some questions, and then you proceed with your research or your patient care. Patients will tell you almost everything. Parenthetically, I'm not giving any of my bench lecture today, but in our rodents, our mice and rats, I also make my basic neuroscientists look at the animals. They can't talk with them yet, but they certainly can look at them and watch them. And what we learned is shown on the lower panel on your left. Whereas heroin caused an on-off effect, as I like to cartoon it, bang, 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 like a jackhammer on receptors in the brain. Methadone had a slow onset of action, a sustained duration of action, with sustained action for 24 hours, as you could see here, with no high, no euphoria, and no withdrawal over that period. We began with low doses, we ascended them to the full treatment dose then and now, 80 to 150 milligrams a day for 98% of patients. And when we did that, we then conducted studies shown by the H, superimposing short-acting narcotics, and we found that there was no high, no euphoria against a dose of 80 milligrams per day or more of methadone. Of course, methadone maintenance led on to L-alpha-acetylmethadol, or LAM, which has been discontinued in usage in Europe and uh, US as well, and then buprenorphine, again, the next generation, which my friend John Lewis developed, and I took naloxone to Hull, England, where his company, Reckitt Coleman, was located, to convince him to add naloxone to the preparation, as we had done in our early research with methadone, not needed for methadone, as the former addicts now in treatment would tell us. Methadone is extremely boring. It's why it was used only to reduce tolerance to prevent withdrawal in the street before we began and while we were doing our research. Whereas heroin and buprenorphine injected give a rapid onset of a high. And you can see on the right panel, the pharmacokinetics, which Chuck and Teresi and I did a decade later, showed that heroin has a half-life of three minutes. It actually doesn't act on receptors. Its first metabolite, 6-acetyl morphine, acts at the mu receptor and provides the immediate onset of an opiate-like effect or high. Methadone, on the other hand, we were able to document, has a half-life of 24 hours for the chemical racemic compound used in treatment worldwide, except for a few early studies in Germany. And the active enantiomer, the L or so-called uh, S enantiomer, have an activity of 48 hours. Right now, there are more than one million people receiving daily methadone maintenance treatment worldwide. About a quarter million in the US, about a half million here in Europe, and at least a quarter million in the rest of the world, with rapidly increasing numbers in treatment in China, the rest of Asia, and most of the world. I'm sad to say that it's now been fully documented. There's terrible opiate addiction, heroin addiction in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there's only one treatment program so far in Sub-Saharan Africa, and India, which desperately needs methadone maintenance treatment, as does many of the regions around it, yet does not have treatment. And we know that methadone, over all these years, is medically safe. QTZ interval prolongation has never caused a problem, and I say never, in a patient in proper methadone treatment who is receiving proper care during the induction period, which had to be changed in Australia and some countries in Europe. It was initially too rapid, but if slow induction, two to six weeks is used, one never sees a problem of any overdose or QTC interval type. Many cases of QTC interval prolongation in pain patients receiving many medications that similarly alter QTC interval and also seen in persons who are abusing multiple other drugs. That, of course, does not happen in proper programs in any part of the world. Now, in 19... In 1981, 
working with the two clinics that were connected with my laboratory, that of the late Aaron Wells and of the Elizabeth Corey, we found a lot of people losing weight, getting lymph nodes, and dying. We knew this looked like hepatitis B, but not really. And it didn't look like hepatitis delta. It looked like something new, and indeed, uh, we began to think it is something new. So my colleague, Dr. Don Desjardins, whom I'm sure most of you know, uh, came to me. He was then working with New York State and said, Mary Jean, I know you have a prospectively collected group of CIRA from 1968 onward. Would you join me and join the US CDC in developing a new test for this disease that is bothering us all, this wasting disorder? And we did that, and this is a curve of the first data from my CIRA bank. We did not see any cases in my CIRA bank until early 1978, when persons coming in for giving blood to us to confidentiality maintain forever for future studies with an ethics board permission, we found that the HIV epidemic presented itself, rapidly rose, so that by 1981, 55% of untreated parenteral drug abusers were HIV positive in the New York area. In that same study, we had a small group who had begun methadone maintenance treatment in one of the two clinics I have mentioned and stayed in clinic during the entire epoch from 1977 up to 83, 84, when we performed the study. And of those, only 9% were HIV positive. Thus, we had the identification of the disease, HIV AIDS, or as you will see, we first called it LAV, which was the name before HIV was given as a nomenclature. And we also realized that methadone was a prevention tool, and we therefore gave this information. In a second separate study with a different cohort of subjects entering methadone treatment research, Dr. David Novick, then at Beth Israel Hospital, and myself conducted this study where we found a dose-dependent response. 6% were HIV positive who had been in treatment at least five years in 1985 when this study was performed and reported at the College on Problems of Drug Dependence, up to 47% of those never in treatment. And you'll see the dose response in treatment, no needle use since treatment, no problems in treatment, up to no treatment. And it is really a remarkable natural history study which taught us unequivocally the power of methadone treatment. The very first report is one with the first authorship of Don Desjardins. It was in the MMWR, the CDC's weekly bulletin. And to my horror, when we tried to present our independent studies to proper journals, we were told that even the few sentences about my laboratory's specific work precluded publication in such journals as the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, or any other fine journal. So we had to hold that data, but that's why we went on to the second study shown in the lower right-hand corner, the study with Dr. Novick, which we were able to publish shown above in the CDC monthly or yearly monograph and there we call it LAV, antibody to LAV, the putative agent of AIDS in parental drug abusers and methadone maintained patients. Historical aspects, 1985. And then below that, an invited paper in the WHO Bulletin with Dr. Inyat Khan as the middle author, Novik, Khan, and Creek. Many of you know Dr. Khan and his then chief, Sartorius. In 1984, Don and I made more than one trip to Washington to convince the NIH about the scourge. They weren't terribly interested. Don may disagree. Tony Fauci, I knew, he was already the power broker at NID, NIADID, the uh, Allergy Infectious Disease Institute. He had been one of the house staff, same time I was, so we knew each other quite well. Tony was great, but he said, drug abusers? Mm. No, it's men who have sex with men. We went to the NIDA. And they had no money, but they did agree that they should start risk reduction efforts. And that's when this whole effort that you'll hear about this morning began. 
It was not very satisfying. I was part of uh, President Reagan's uh, partnership for drug-free America fighting drug abuse. It was quite an amazing thing. There were only two of us in the whole 500 panel that had been directly involved in treatment, but no matter, we began to insinuate our problems and issues and findings. I went to Geneva alone. I was already serving on this WHO program planning work group and a narcotics control group, and I spoke to Inyat Khan and Sartorius in June, uh, July of 84, and they said, we're so sorry you have this horrible problem in US, especially in New York. We have no addiction in Europe or the rest of the world. And I said, utter nonsense. We're already doing research with Christian Trepo. We're doing research with people in Denmark. We're doing research with people in Sweden. You have the problem. And then they told me something I had to learn from them. The WHO is not allowed to say they have a disease until official word comes from the country that they have the disease. And that's why we're not yet hearing about most of Sub-Saharan Africa having a terrible problem with heroin addiction. Well, uh, the third thing I did was reach out to those around us. So these are three early papers. These uh, references will be on my website. I think I will put this lecture on my website because as I put it together for this THS meeting, it dawned on me, we've never pulled it all together before. It's an early story that I think people ought to be able to hear about. And further research from 89 to 90 uh, included some of our early findings and how important they were and included the fact that um, we were invited by the Nobel Committee in Sweden to go present the ethics of HIV research in 1990, which was very early still. Now, after reaching out, my colleagues in Sweden, Olaf Flix, working with Lars Gunnar and Leif Grunblatt, recapitulated our study that we had done with, in my lab with Corey and Wells and my lab with Novik. And they reported in this very small little paper in uh, JAMA that they had found exactly the same thing we did. And I'll summarize it here. The first replication of methadone maintenance treatment was not even other places in New York. Lars Gunnar from Uppsala was working in our laboratory. He returned to Uppsala and developed the first methadone maintenance treatment program outside of the Rockefeller University. In the original program, he had 34 subjects. He did the first randomized control, placebo control trial. 17 went into methadone, 17 got no medication. Six of the 17 controls died of overdose or other causes related to heroin addiction within five years. 73% times the expected death rate. Eight ultimately requested to come into methadone treatment, and uh, of those that came into treatment, most stayed in treatment with no illicit drug use. Now, there were 174 people in the first 20 years. Now in Sweden, I'm proud to say, they have similar criteria for entering into methadone or buprenorphine treatment. They are offered equally by the physicians and counselors. Each patient is evaluated and they're given whichever treatment seems most appropriate. With the knowledge, if they start with buprenorphine naloxone and their degree of tolerance is too high for that medication, they then progress to methadone treatment an ultimately very sensible approach, which I'm proud to say I help teach. We do not have that approach in US. I wish we did. Minimal constraints after initial treatment, but as Dr. Herb Kleber, who spoke earlier this week, pointed out to us, every patient needs counseling and access to medical and psychiatric care initially, so it is prudent to enter a proper program and not just have medication given to you to take home. Now, Sweden, bitter experience, recapped other places in the world. But there was a health minister, and listen well, I know France's story, I decided not to tell it today, but uh, uh, Dr. Trepo knows this story and uh, went over it with me last night again. Of those patients who were admitted to Swedish methadone maintenance programs, before the epidemic hit Sweden, which was someplace around 85, there were only, uh, of the 30, of the, all the patients admitted, the initial 67 followed by 32 more, 
In the initial 67 patients who were admitted early and stayed in treatment, 3% were HIV positive when studied in 1985. In 1985, 16% of those admitted in the interim, 84 to 88, were positive. The methadone program was closed by the government for several years because of the health minister's denial of this being an effective evidence-based treatment. And when it was reopened with the discovery of these findings, 57% were HIV positive, essentially recapitulating the New York experience. So going on, we, went to, we were sent by the government of Israel, someone to train. We went on, they wanted to prevent AIDS. The bottom line is they did. And then more recently, my trainee who began, began the treatment program in Tel Aviv, Israel, has gone on to conduct a study, which is in press now. You haven't seen it yet. And we've developed a methadone maintenance treatment in Macau. The one difference from the China mainland programs that I've helped develop is adequate doses of methadone are used. We have a very high retention rate, and HIV has been kept at the very low rate, which it was when we were asked to come in and start treatment. Paula Piccolo from Italy was in my laboratory in around 2000. She found that of those in treatment at that epoch, 2000, 13 years ago, uh, roughly 60% had hepatitis C, and of those, only about 26% were HIV positive, way down from what it had been initially. And we have seen this continue to drop. But remember, H hepatitis C is the most infectious of these diseases far more infectious than hepatitis B, which in turn is less infectious than HIV. Now, two new words. Uh, 13 years ago, my laboratory studied the first genetic studies of the human mu opioid receptor gene. And if you look at the upper left of this cartoon, you will see what we call the N-terminus of the mu receptor. That is where opiates bind. And you'll see two little things in yellow. C17T and 118G. Both of these we have found are associated with addiction. The A118G, way back there before we published our first paper in PNAS in 1998, we studied the functionality because we predicted that not would just pharmacogenetics possibly be altered by a coding region or actual peptide or actual receptor variant, but indeed, Physiology or would be altered. Therefore, we coined the word physiogenetics. And we went on to show that this uh, A118G variant binds our longest endorphin, beta endorphin, more tightly, and it also gives greater signaling. And therefore, we predicted in that first paper that we would find stress responsivity altered in healthy humans with one copy of this variant. That has proven to be true in about 20 laboratory studies, including uh, a few from our own laboratory, but replicated by many worldwide. We also predicted that it would be associated with two addictions. This variant would be strongly associated with two addictions. One where people love stress, that would be alcoholism, and one where people hate stress, that would be opiate addiction. An opiate addict would do anything to avoid stress. That is why they fear withdrawal. And in fact, we went on in a collaboration in Stockholm, Sweden, with the Karolinska and Marcus Heilig, now at NIAAA, to show that this A118G functional variant is strongly associated with opiate addiction and more recently also with alcoholism. So we've gone on very recently at the request of NIMH and other institutes. And we have asked the question, are any of these variants associated with the natural history of HIV AIDS infection. And using a cohort, the WISE cohort, women with HIV infection and normal controls, we've asked the question if having this stress variant altered the response of coming into good healthcare treatment, maybe with ACT, maybe with some other monotherapy, but before heart was developed and widely spread, 94 to 96 by the groups of Tony Fauci and David Ho from my institution at the Rockefeller. And what we found is you see on that top bar a very flat curve as opposed to the bottom one. The top curve are people that have 
two copies of this gene variant, and they did not clear HIV virus as rapidly as people with the prototype or the GG you see on the bottom, and the heterozygotes are in the middle. And we've gone on to study the prodynorphin gene, which acts at the kappa receptor. It has many polymorphisms. We have again documented an association of a polymorphism with the ability to clear HIV before heart. Thank goodness we have heart, many forms thereof, now called art more commonly, and you'll hear about that. But this very recent genetics work, and this paper has just come out, uh, will teach you that genetics may alter our response to age treatment. So with this historical background, and hopefully bringing you up to the present, I will thank all the many people directly in my laboratory, as well as those adjuncted to my laboratory. And uh, you will see uh, a picture of this crowd. And that's my group now, multi-ethnic, multicultural, many age brackets. And this is our gorgeous new laboratory. Do come visit. Thank you.